Let's get this started, and uh, then uh, the good stuff is always at the end. Uh, like we said, I'm Maurits, I work at the Heineken company uh, as a data engineer, and today I want to tell you more about ML SecOps. Um, why? Because I really truly think it's not just another buzzword, it's super important in how we're actually working with data and machine learning within the Heineken company. And all the details and bits and pieces, I will uh, tell you more about it. Let's make it interactive. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, and to do put it the other way around, I have a question for you. Who's actually using already analytics and machine learning in this organization? A couple of hands. Uh, so I think a lot of others are software engineers. Uh, that's good. I think more and more people will actually start to be using machine learning in their organizations because data is everywhere. You see uh, uh, the data-driven insights coming up, uh, but it's actually quite tough to scale the um, machine learning and analytics throughout an organization because a lot of people want to have access to it. Uh, there are little resources, maybe little knowledge. And what you want to do is, in the end, actually enable people to start using the insights that you can get from data to become a stronger and actually a smarter company. And I think that could apply not only to the beer industry, but to every industry uh, around. First, talking about the beer industry, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Heineken. Uh, of course, you probably know the beer. Uh, you maybe also know that it was founded here in Amsterdam, actually not far uh, from here. Uh, currently, uh, that's a Heineken experience. I definitely recommend you to go if you have a bit of time. Um, Next to that old brewery, we have our offices. So we're here really here in the heart of Amsterdam, but we're running an international company still from the tiny town of Amsterdam. Uh, Heineken and all of its other brands are being sold in over 190 countries. And in 90 of those countries, we actually have a subsidiary. So we have one or multiple breweries. They're locally brewing the local beers, the Heineken beers, a lot of different brands because over the years, Heineken acquired and started more and more brands. I think, I don't know how you feel about it, especially with those craft beers nowadays, but beer is a truly local product. So we are also quite a decentralized organization with a lot of different uh, sub-organizations, uh, breweries and teams throughout uh, the company, uh, but also with our brands. And of course, the 0.0, .0 beers are coming up very quickly. Uh, I think it's amazing that Heineken 0.0 is now being sold in over 100 countries, and we have the ambition to make all of our brands available in 0.0. Um, but also Amstel, which is of course named after the famous river here in Amsterdam, Sol, Bira Moretti from Italy, Bintang from Indonesia, Desperados, and a lot of other brands that I cannot mention right now. But that's, for us, one of the interesting data sources to work with. And we do that with a team of experienced uh, data engineers, data scientists, analytics translators, and even also BI specialists. Um, we have our team here in Amsterdam, so that's a global team. But in every subsidiary, we also have local data teams where we collaborate together. And there you already see the difference between maybe more of the old way, how we would run the Heineken company with really local breweries, and more of this international, skilled organization where we, from a far more global, can come up with the uh, data products that we can use on a local level. Because if we cannot make the impact locally, if you cannot make your beer more tasteful, fresher and uh, better served, then it's totally useless. Uh, what do we do? We work with our team of about uh, 100 people. We work on analytics cases of, of course, sales. We're a big marketing company. We ship a lot of beers, um, but we also analyze our breweries and the beer color, for example. Um, and we do that in a lot of different cases. If you want to know more about it, please come up to me. Happy to tell you more about that. But what I said, actually here today, I want to talk with you about how to make sure that everybody in that organization, for us in the Heineken company, can use data. Because our goal as a global analytics team is to enable an organization to access and le uh, leverage data irrespective of their technical knowledge. And you do that by providing them freedom to use that data, but within boundaries. And those boundaries are set and enabled by technology. 
And the way we do that and the way how we look at it is something that I'm going to share right here. I think most of you are nowadays familiar with development operations, with DevOps. DevOps has been around for years already. I think we cannot work in the software industry anymore in a scalable way without DevOps. And in some way, analytics and machine learning always has been catching up a little bit with the software engineering principles and approaches. And you see the same uh, currently happening with machine learning operations, which is obviously the combination of machine learning and development operations. Because why would you like, come up with an idea completely yourself if you can already borrow some of the good stuff from DevOps and then apply it and adopt it within machine learning? And I did it like this. So this is the machine learning operations lifecycle. I designed it myself. Uh, you can read more about it also on a blog and a paper I wrote about it. It consists of four stages. Of course, without data, we're, no we're nowhere. So you need to ingest your data. Imagine that we have to ingest data from a local brewery somewhere in Mexico. The data is a little bit messy, so we need to validate it, we need to transform it, and we need to extract some features from it. Uh, that is the data management uh, phase. We're now using dbt, for example, for that, and that's really important because if we can get the data at a good quality, that is the foundation to build your other products on, especially if you can harmonize it uh, between different uh, countries to make sure that the data from Mexico is in a similar way structured as the data from South Africa or Indonesia. Because then the fun part starts, I would almost say. Then is the phase when our data scientists can start modeling with that data. So they experiment, they check out the data, they train maybe their first model, they validate if that model is actually working. So for example, uh, currently I know one of my colleagues is working on a model to uh, better schedule uh, our trucks, which are running uh, and delivering beer. Can we maybe do that in a more efficient way so that we have less trucks on the road, so also less CO2? Uh, and maybe not the first time, but in iterations, we optimize that model. So that's also why you see that is, this is in cycles. It's no, never that it's just a start and an end, it's a continuation from the process. But if we're happy about a model, then we, go and continue on and put go to the development phase. Because in the development phase, we turn that model into a pipeline. And the pipe, that's actually not something that a data engineer does. We support with that process, but we want our data scientists to be able, with the tooling that we provide to them, to build their own pipelines. Because if they have to wait for us while they throw their code over the fence, and me, for example, needs to turn that into a pipeline, that is Slack that we cannot use. So we build that, we test that, automate it in a pipeline, and obviously we package this and then deploy it via a CICD pipeline, again, to our cloud environment. And then we run it. So we configure it, so we maybe configure that this pipeline is for Mexico and not for Indonesia. Uh, then it gets deployed to the right environment. We obviously monitor it, and uh, then we operate it. Uh, so these are the different stages. But if we look at the details, I've seen like in development uh, throughout the years now. And that is really more importance for security. Because if you have a super enthusiastic product owner who wants you to develop this new dashboard for logistics or, s or sales, then actually um, you want uh, not at the end to think, start thinking about security. You need really need to do that at the beginning. And Uh, so if you do that at the beginning, you have to shift left your security. So you really have from the start on, start thinking about what are the tricks and what are the dangers of security issues when I'm developing my, when I'm ingesting my data, when I'm developing my model, when I'm deploying my pipeline. Because if a team, let's say our market team, marketing team is depending how we should run our Champions League ads based on one of our dashboards, and it goes down because of a security issue, then we have a l big issue with their adoption and trust into data analytics. And I use MLSecOps for that, machine learning security operations. And we have actually, I took five takeaways here, which I think are super important when you're thinking about this machine learning lifecycle from a security point of view. 
Those are, to start with, the separate environments. So the old DTAP structure. We also use a DTAP structure. So we have a development uh, environment, then we have a test environment, an acceptance environment, and a production environment. And in this development envir environment, our data scientist has a lot of freedom. Freedom to access the data, freedom to ex uh, experiment with the data. But actually, from the test environment onwards, all pipelines are only deployed uh, with CI-CD pipelines. So we automate that process. One other takeaway is uh, the package management. Because you don't want some vulnerable packages to end up in your code and maybe uh, steal your data, infiltrate your system, or in any other kind of way. And nowadays, we're depending so much on open source software that it's something that we cannot check ourselves anymore. I think most of you are familiar with the log4j issue. Um, earlier on, we really had to check manually, hand by hand, if any of our pipelines was using a log4j or a similar vulnerable package inside. And maybe back in the days it was still possible, but if we're running solutions for over 100 countries in dashboards and multiple solutions, we cannot check it one by one anymore. So this is one of the clear examples where actually also machine learning and AI is supporting our uh, process itself. Um, and that's also with observability. Uh, logging is, has been something we're doing for ages now, but we now want to extend it more. So observability is really the understanding, the deep understanding of what your solution is about, what are the possible risks, but also if a failure uh, exists, how to tackle it and how to fix it. And for that, we extended our uh, logging capabilities, but we also do a lot of knowledge sharing and standardization so that we know that we don't have to support 10 variants of a machine learning training pipeline, but we actually do one or two and in that way, we can more easily support it and make sure that it's also more reliable. And then, of course, the data and model quality. Uh, we want, in an early stage, to know that if uh, a local subsidiary maybe suddenly changes its, uh, uh, its database or there's some other failure happening, that we already know that the data failed in the ingestion phase and that the quality of the model decreased so that we can warn, actually, our end users at the dashboard instead of our end users calling us with, say, okay, it seems that it has been like not updated or a false um, uh, advice. Can you maybe take a look at, uh, at it? And the last one uh, is secret management. Obviously, we don't want any of our uh, secrets, any of our API keys being stored on a local level. We want them. Uh, all stored in a key vault, uh, but we also uh, want a very strict restriction on what of our users can access. Uh, so our users uh, have only access to certain environments, they only have access to certain uh, uh, data sources, because we don't want the data of uh, Brazil being suddenly accessed by Belgium and the other way around. Um, then I would like to zoom in uh, to this, because what we want to do to actually democratize that data is providing a uh, workbench for our uh, machine learning, or for our data scientists, to work with the data themselves. Because what I said in the beginning is really how can we democratize data? How can we provide the freedom within boundaries for them to work with the data themselves? And that's uh, where we came up with uh, this ML workspace uh, where users can, in a secure cloud environment, so no longer on a local level, but on a cloud level, can actually access the data and experiment with it so that we know that it's been uh, within boundaries. What are then our requirements for such a secure machine learning workbench? Um, it should be a cloud-hosted workspace. It should be accessible via single sign-on, because then we exactly know who, which user it is and also which permission each user has. Um, it must be prevent any vulnerable downloads. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on the internet, both from packages and other stuff. We don't want that to access this secure environment. It has, should have seamlessly integrations with other tools, 
Not that we create a solution and we, that we have wonderful insights, but that we cannot use it in some other kind of way. And in the end, we want to have policy controls and we, of course, want to have this enforcement uh, automated. So uh, those were the uh, requirements that we came up with. And this is actually the initial, maybe I would say, solution that we designed. Uh, so what we have over here is uh, our use case uh, for, in this case, still an unsecure ML workbench. Uh, I will go to the secure one uh, in a couple of slides. So you see that we have all of our data uh, stored in a repository, in an Azure DevOps repository. Uh, that code is being deployed via a CICD pipeline. Actually, what we also do is that we, if we have in the heart of our solution, which is currently Azure Machine Learning Studio, if we develop a solution there, then we also store it back in Azure repository. Uh, so we have all of our code versioned in Git um, on Azure. Um, and this Machine Learning Studio is depending on a storage account, obviously to access the data and to store some of its configurations. It has a container registry. Uh, if we train a model, if we have a compute environment set up to work with this large amount of data, then of course we need to have our um, uh, virtual machines being available. Uh, then we have this key vault. Uh, this key vault is uh, necessary, what I said, for our secret management. And we have application insights, which is doing a part of the logging. Actually, already to that, we added New Relic. New Relic is providing us with additional insights and additional warnings uh, on the logging side. So that is improving our observability. What I want to zoom in with you about is this connection to the internet. Because, of course, if we want to work with a Pandas package or maybe a Log4j package or some other package, currently our users would go to the Python index or the Anaconda index, which is publicly available on the internet. So they always say, okay, we need that access to the internet. Well, I rather would do one thing, is cut off the access to the internet. Um, but then they would not have any packages anymore, and it would mean that a lot of generic stuff that is available that they already have experience with, we would have to then stop using it, redevelop it in any way. That's a total waste of time. Uh, we're also, of course, in search of talent, so we want our people to really work on any additional value to the Heineken company and not doing work what is already greatly available in open source uh, software. But there is also the risk. Because if you are under pressure, if you are searching for the package, if you make maybe one typo, something can go wrong. And I don't want to think bad of my data scientists and other users, also data engineers like myself, but there's always a possible issue. I, don't, I think all of us receive phishing emails. They look really trustworthy. You maybe have clicked on it once or twice, even after all of the trainings but there's always a possible risk. So that's why we started searching for some support there. And actually, I have a quiz for you that I brought. So these are uh, two packages on the Python uh, package index, the PyPy index. And like you see, they pretty look, look pretty much the same. Maybe take a minute to check them out, because I'm going to ask you, either left or right is a vulnerable package. All right, so if I would ask the audience, who would think that this AOI HTTP SOX 5 is a vulnerable package? And who would think that this AIO HTTP SOX um, on the right, uh, for, for you on the right, it's actually the vulnerable package. And who has no clue at all? <laughs> Luckily, one is correct. The other one is actually, uh, is actually a vulnerable package. Uh, I borrowed this example from the Sonatai blog. And what you see right here is the, with the addition of number five, is a vulnerable package. It's actually aiming to infiltrate Windows machines, 
and in that way to infect it and maybe even steal your data. You could maybe see it because uh, it has some. Uh, it has been uploaded uh, quite recently and updated. Um, but how often do you check the upload date, or are you going to go over all of the version controls and other stuff? Uh, I can also not ask all of my data scientists to check it. And even there's another issue. Maybe because it's open source software, somebody infiltrated a trustworthy package with their inf uh, infected software, and then something that you trust uh, before is now an issue. So because we don't think we can like, invest our time and make sure that we have always check it one by one, we need some kind of a virus scanner. And that's where Sonotype comes in. So what we now use, we earlier checked out uh, JFrog, but we nowadays uh, use uh, Sonotype Nexus Firewall. And this is really for us a firewall in package management. Uh, so what it ha does, it's a, an, a wall between the internet and the packages that we use. And of course, some packages, there's no issue at all. That's the green line. We know it's safe. Uh, it can enter the pipeline. It's good to use. And then we have the uh, suspicious area, where actually the packages uh, enters a quarantine. And uh, the Sonotype uh, team is going to check it, sometimes even with their uh, human research team. And if they say that it's a uh, vulnerability, it gets blocked and it's unavailable. And from, of course, known uh, vulnerabilities, those get blocked right away. And in that way, we, all the way at the right, know that the packages that we actually use in our solutions are trustworthy and are scanned, even if at things come up. What, sorry? At that, time. at that time, absolutely. Uh, and it gives us also an opportunity to, if something comes up, that we can directly see all across the system um, it with a central point which packages are maybe using a vulnerable uh, issue. So if we go back to this image of the secure machine learning workbench, is there we set up on our own cloud a Nexus repository, which functions as a package index, together with Nexus Firewall, which is actually that scanner of all of these packages. And that is our restriction um, to the internet. And to be honest, sometimes our data scientists are quite scary about that. But we had to explain it to them. Uh, the Sonotype with uh, Ryan, who's sitting over there, actually also joined us to make them more and more aware of uh, what the issue is and why this is actually a thing that is coming up. And now they actually see that it's taking away issues from them instead of that it's um, blocking them in their further development. And in that way, we have a secure machine learning workbench that we can not only use here in Amsterdam with our global team, that we can even like scale uh, through all of the Heineken company and also let them use on a local level. And that's those are the boundaries and guardrails that we want to provide. So if I get back uh, to the earlier points that I shared with you, is if you want to scale machine learning throughout your organization, you really need machine learning security operations. And you do that with those separate environments, the package management, which I extensively talked about, with the increased observability, with a data and quality model that is uh, good, and with the secure, uh, uh, security management. So these are for us the basic principles in which we design our solutions, which we are reminded on a daily basis, and where we also search for support from different vendors in making that happen to make sure that we can make data and insights available throughout the Heineken company. Talking about the Heineken company, actually this is an, uh, an image I, I drove by. Uh, I noticed that um, the beer is just being delivered here to the Burs van Berlage. Um, maybe not in the most modern way, but actually we still have horses here in Amsterdam running around, uh, and uh, that's a great opportunity because um, of course, including the questions that we have here, I also want to invite 
all of you uh, to join us uh, later uh, directly after this talk during the break at the Sonotype uh, booth. Uh, there are Heineken beers already available over there. So if you mention uh, the word, word ML SecOps, then there's a beer for you, and then we can have a further chat about why it's so important to include security into the scaling of your machine learning. Thank you very much. <laughs>